This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode we are reviewing a brand new title released in the UK about two weeks ago. It's the A24 movie I Saw the TV Glow. Now it's getting a ton of traction online as usual with A24 movies. Seems to be pretty divisive. Uh, You are either in camp, this is a great movie, or you're in camp, nothing happens in this movie. And then of course... It wouldn't be an E24 movie without the is it horror or is it not horror argument which seems to be pretty much every title they release regardless how horror they are or how light on horror they are. Um, I don't think that's going to go away. I think we're I think that's here to stay now and um, I'm not here to challenge the veracity or validity of the movie as a horror movie. Uh, I will be including it in my top 20 at the end of the year for sure. But... I think more importantly, is it actually a good movie is the question we should probably ask first. And um, yeah, we're going to get to all that after the first break. Now, the director themselves have um, already had a title that got a ton of traction a couple of years ago. That movie was We're All Going to the World Sphere. That movie itself had a similar reaction. And this kind of feels like a flexing of that kind of storyline about isolation, connection, and rather than the the kind of grasp of the internet and the law and the connection that you get through that, in the case of this one here, it's set in a different time period, ostensibly before the internet was in everyone's homes uh, or on their phones, and because it's set in the mid to late 90s to start with anyway, um, actually it's a lot of nostalgia um, points for me. Because I would be, what, slightly older than the character portrayed in this movie at the time when this movie is set chronologically. If that makes sense. Long way of saying, you know, it kind of spoke to me in some way, shape or form. So yeah, that's the movie we're going to be discussing. I saw the TV glow. Now, it's going to be very difficult to do this movie without kind of leaning more into territory that might be perceived as spoiler. I will say even... Seeing the word spoiler on this movie is kind of a misnomer in that a lot of this is subjective to how you, well, a lot of great kind of quasi art house horror movies are. A lot of what you bring to this, a lot of how you connect to the story will inform what you take away from it or what you think is going on. And vice versa, if you have no connection to the subject matter, eh, it's going to be boring. There's no, there's no getting around that. So... Once I put that caveat out there, I will say that I will announce when we are doing spoiler. And yeah, it's up to you. Use your better judgment. You are the best judge of what you look at on the internet or what you listen to on your devices. So I'm putting the power with you. I will announce it out there. If you genuinely want to know nothing more about this movie, the best thing to do is stop this review, go away and check it out and then come back afterwards. And as I always say, if you just don't care, stick around. Don't say that you weren't warned. So with that, I'm going to take a short break. You're going to see the teaser trailer for I Saw the TV Globe when we return. Details on the movie, my non-spoiler, and then spoiler review and then scoring. All that's coming up right after this. Can I stay up late to watch The Pink Opaque tonight? Isn't that a show for girls? Sometimes my bed's on. You know what you should do? Isabel's kind of the main character. Tara's my favorite. She doesn't take shit from anybody. They got a few suggestions about this whole look you're going for. Who feels more real than my life? It was a TV show. Are you sure that's all it was? It's just the suburbs. And welcome back. So you just saw the teaser for I Saw the TV Glow. Now, like I say, it was released two weeks ago, so the end of July in the UK and it had come out 
a month and a bit before in the States. So chances are you've probably already read a ton of reviews or you've seen the movie already. And as thus, you are in a better place to educate yourself as to whether or not you want to continue on with this review or you don't. So yeah, once again, more power to you, ladies and gents. So let me give you some details on the movie right now. I Saw the TV Glow is written and directed by Jane Sean Brun. The movie itself stars Justice Smith, Bridget Lundy Prine, Ian Foreman, Helena Howard, Lindsay Jordan, Danielle Deadweiler, Fred Durst, Connor O'Malley, Emma Porter, Madeline Riley, Amber Benson, Albert Burney, Michael C. Morona, and a bunch of other people here as well. Synopsis for the movie is listed on IMDb as two teenagers bond over their love of a supernatural TV show, but it is mysteriously cancelled. So on its face, I saw a TV glow kind of works in three facets, um, and depending on your connection to those facets, I think is how well the story will sync up for you. If you can't relate, then I think this movie will appear to you as a viewer as a very cold and slow movie, right? A movie that is about awkward interactions um, and pretty lighting and maybe nothing else with an ending which feels like very out there if you don't connect with the subtext, right? So that's, that's the starting premise. I think if you do connect with the movie, it's likely you're going to connect with it on one of three facets. One of them is about how we connect in isolation um, to people based on interest and how we have to adapt, or if we don't adapt, how those connections can almost hinder us making more meaningful friendships and relationships moving on. So case in point, I growing up, massive metal fan, right? Totally huge into metal. I predominantly hung around with a lot of people that weren't into metal. Um, and I hung around with, well, I went to a school where no one really listened to metal music. And I was in high school in the 90s and everyone was into Oasis and Blur or Rave and Techno and like when I found metal I found it very difficult to communicate so a lot of the friendships that I made in high school and growing up I actually don't have now um, my close nearest and dearest friends have all been formed from when I went to college and I studied audio technology at college so actual music production and in that course my best friend attended that course and uh, bonded over a love of music and various other things and that I've been his best man, he's been my best man. Um, that all came very much later in life because I didn't have those connections. So in some weird way, and we're going to get to the movie, trust me, I promise. Um, the friendships that I had uh, as a kid and at high school were when music came up, I would listen to what other people listened to so I could talk about it. I didn't really like it. I um, like took part in... like you know, school football games, I hate football, but I did it because that's kind of how I make friends. Now, there were people at my school that didn't want to make those connections or didn't want to try and quote-unquote fit in, and as a result, you would see them having lunch alone, being very isolated, etc. So it's two sides of the coin. You can either try and adapt and try and feign an interest in something to create connections, um, and then you get a better judge of what the person is like beyond their interests, believe it or not, people have depth, um, or you choose not to, and that can be a solitary life, and also can like weirdly ingrain a difficulty in creating those connections later on as an adult. So, it's the first thing, so isolation in that capacity. Um, the second thing is pop culture in general, like if you grew up in the, the 80s and 90s, pop culture was pretty much your identity, it was the bands you listened to, it was the movies you watched. It was the TV shows, particularly in the 90s. Once again, I was a weird kid, so I loved Twin Peaks. I loved Erie, Indiana. I loved uh, The X-Files. Um, I loved Buffy. Like, all these things. And Charmed. Oh my god, I watched Charmed far too late as well. But 
those shows have a mythology that you want to talk about. Twin Peaks was such a revelation in TV that everyone wanted to talk about it all the time. And that one was one that in America, um, for the most part, had that shared synchronicity of expanding over people's interests. You didn't have to be into Blue Velvet um, or The Elephant Man by David Lynch to be able to sit down and talk about Twin Peaks. Um, it helped if you could because there was a bit of a background in that, but it kind of transcended that. The X-Files were similar. It kind of, you know, it was much bigger. But to a teenager in the UK and the town that I grew up, not a lot of people were into the X-Files. Not a lot of people were into sci-fi. I love Star Trek. Um, not a lot of people loved that stuff. I had a Klingon dictionary. I just want to shame myself on this recording right now. Um, not a lot of people are into that. And as a result, you, you're desperate to talk about these things as common interest, similar to the music side of things. And also coming back to those things now, um, some of them hold up well, some of them don't. And it's weird how important those things are to you in your life that when you revisit them, you see them with maybe the eyes that other people saw them at the time. Strange. Life will beat you down. Life has a great way of making things that feel charming and whimsical feel silly and wasteful. I, d I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a cynic in me. I don't know. Um, and then the last thing that the movie kind of subtext that you could connect to here is specifically around the identity of um, homosexuality um, and the, the stigmas that surrounded that then even in the 90s. I know a lot of people like to think that you know, we've been charting this great road and all the work's done because you can get married. Um, regardless if it's a man to a woman, woman to a uh, woman, man to a man, etc. Um, like, the 90s were <laughs> not a kind time to that. I would say even now it's still not a kind time to that. And I think it's important that we remember these things uh, and shine a light on them. Because if you don't analyse what went wrong if you don't analyse where we are at a point of time, there's absolutely no way to judge the context of how far you've come, right? So there's that as well. Uh, and basically, so hiding your interests, um, hiding your connections to pop culture, holding that deep inside and in, hiding your sexuality as well. It's kind of one of those three prongs, I think, are the, the ways that you get your hooks into I Saw the TV Glow, and then you kind of ride it out to the end to see where it goes. I will say this about the movie. In a non-spoiler fashion, I found the acting good. I found the dialogue good. I thought the cinematography was great. I really enjoyed the pacing of this movie and I like the high level concept that it brings. Now, you will note I said that I only thought the acting was good um, instead of great. And I know there's a lot of people that might take umbrage with that. I think some performances are on the money. I think other performances, especially as time forwards in the movie, where they become maybe a little bit more stunted, and I don't know if that's by design and by choice, it possibly is, um, considering the, the acting quality behind us, but I, I found it, it became a bit stunted towards the end. Um, I think... I also said the script was good. It's a similar thing. There isn't a huge amount of dialogue in I Saw the TV Glow. And as a result, you can spend an inordinate amount of time going back over. And I've seen this movie four times now. But you can spend an inordinate amount of time examining what is actually there. What is not said and what might be in between. And at times, I felt like I got a full grasp of that. I also think that there are certain undertones in the movie that don't connect with me directly because of my upbringing, my background. And like I say, my just in general my sexuality um which means i didn't grasp it all completely and that's a failure on me not on the movie but i can only judge it on what i know i can only judge how good a painting is by the way i can contextually perceive it and the way it connects to my brain i can't you know the same with food i can only say i like something if i like the taste of it um if it's sour to me uh, and I don't like sour flavours, even though someone else might love sour flavours, to me it just doesn't connect. So I will say that once again, all these reviews are subjective. Um, I think the cinematography is super strong here, like incredible. In fact, actually the, the, the connection between specific static shots 
um, the lighting which is absolutely phenomenal but the kind of high concept creation of not only the TV show which is um, which is shown throughout the movie that the characters are obsessed with um, but on top of that I think the, the creature design the Oh man, Look, the, the connection to the 90s and the way some of the transition and exposition shots are done where it becomes very playful, very over the top, almost like you're watching a TV show. It's very, 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 very well done. Um, and then lastly, like I say, I thought the pacing was brilliant. A lot of that comes with the score. Um, so you get two scores here. One of them is the original soundtrack by Alex G. He had worked previously on uh, We're All Going to the World's Fair. Um, I love that score for that one, I love this one as well. It's more synth-based, whereas the We're All Going to the World's Fair had a collection of kind of more kind of fragile sound and instrumentation. Uh, but this one has like an um, has a, an actual soundtrack, which is a collection of different artists. Um, of those artists, some of them actually appear in this in a kind of quasi Twin Peaks slash Buffy sort of scene where characters are in a bar and bands from the soundtrack are playing. Now cards on the table. One of them is an artist called King Woman. I fucking love King Woman. Um, kind of doomy, stonery, sludgy, gloomy, shoegazy, female fronted awesomeness. And she provides one of the darker scenes, which is very akin to Twin Peaks. It reminded me of... It reminded me, in some respects, about Fire Walk With Me. Which of the time period? I mean, Power Walk with me was what, 94? And this movie's technically set after 96, so you've got to think that Jane had seen the movie as well, and maybe that has stuck in the back. And also, if you've never seen Fire Walk with me, what are you doing with your life? Go and see Fire Walk with me, it's terrifying. Um, but I think there's a, a bit of link in there. Love King Women, so uh, they did a brand new song for the soundtrack but also did Psychic Wounds from their previous release, Celestial Blues. Mmm, chef's kiss, live performance, look great, love it. So, that, that, that side of things is awesome. Overall, like I say, I've seen the movie four times now. I think about it a lot when it finishes, and that's usually... Those are the movies I like to come back to. Granted, I love a movie that's splatter, gore, tits, you know... And I'm not, I'm not even going to... I'm not even just going to leave it at tits. Dick comes out, dick comes out. Um, you know, I, li I like cheesy, low low budget, like no think movies. I also really like movies that kind of make me think afterwards, hurt my brain a little bit and stick with me for days afterwards. Those are the ones that I feel I want to, very similar <laughs> to the movie, kind of hypothesis idea that the TV show the kids watch kind of take over part of the brain that they want to talk about and connect. The movie to me has that same effect even as an adult even as a 42 year old it kind of has the same the same like the same nails clawed into my back um i love this movie i'm i, I can't even sugarcoat it um even the, the bits that i marked down do not hamper anything about it and as it stands just now it's one of the best i've seen in the genre this year and um, i'm gonna give it a five i uh, love it i gave we're all going to the world's fair a five as well i know there's a lot of people out there that think that is ridiculously high but guess what it's not your review it's my review and i can say whatever i want so there we go so yeah a uh, five out of five for um i saw the tv glow we're about to do spoilers so this is your last one and i don't think i can fully spoil the movie but i'm going to talk about the story and uh, cover a little bit of the detail and I think my interpretation of what the ending is and uh, as a result that might spoil your viewing so uh, spoilers are happening in three two one let's talk spoilers right so the movie follows this young kid who um has trouble connecting with other people clearly is uncomfortable in his own skin and I think that's almost inevitably uh, based around his uh, sexual identity uh, and orientation I would say as well um, he is at school and meets another kind of loner girl who has this uh, book um, on the TV show The Pink Opaque which is basically a kind of quasi charmed meets Buffy meets Eerie Indiana rolled into one and this kid has obviously seen it on the TV but knows nothing about it wants to know more about it um, and this older girl creates a kind of reluctant friendship with him um, and we see it 
from the kid's point of view in the first part of the movie. And he lives with his uh, mum and his dad. His dad is played by Fred Durst of Limp Biscuit fame, who doesn't do much in this, but is an ever-present kind of cloud in this movie of another side of the 90s, which I was also very much into. Uh, that kind of cringy new metal side. I still love it. It's still real to me, god damn it. Um, but he's he's the, the dad. He's kind of of the macho opinion that it's a girls TV show, so he shouldn't be watching it. And his mum, who's much more tender to him, she um, is clearly ailing with something. She has an illness of some description. I think it's revealed later on it's cancer. Uh, although they don't explicitly say cancer. Um, she's, you know, she's she's on the way out for lack of a better term which isn't as cold and callous as what I just said but ultimately what you have here is this relationship he has with this girl and she gets more and more involved with the culture of the TV show whereas to our main character he is more interested in I think some of the freedoms the show creates. I think it's because it's, it's seen as being relatively campy at the same time as being quite dark. The the, the the mythology and the background of it, the pop culture aspect is what, what has him. Um, at some point in the movie, uh, and we, we see from his friend's point of view, a uh, female character in this movie, she, Maddie, uh, I should say that's her name, um, we see that she lives in a very abusive household, uh, possibly drunk father. Um, maybe a shade of there's maybe something inappropriate sexually happening there with abuse, but it's never touched on and it seems to be in the background. I don't know if that's where my brain goes. She decides she wants to run away. She tries to take our main character with her. He doesn't want to go. And um, she disappears like the following day. TV shows cancelled about the same time, which is very strange. And all that's left is a burning TV in the garden. And then we jump forward, like, at pace through various stages of his life as we find he has continued to, you know, have a disconnect from people, feels very socially awkward, um, doesn't make friendships. And then we jump forward to him being, like, very late teens, early 20s, and she returns. And she returns and says to him that she went across and became part of the show. Um, she did that by going through the TV possibly and she's managed to escape and come back and it sets up a whole thing and I'm not going to spend too much time, the movie does it a lot better than me sets up this idea of what the TV show actually is and who they actually are in relation to the show itself and that's why it's such a powerful connection to them and then basically tries to get him to go with her, bury themselves alive, this time again he avoids her and she disappears and never enters the, the the movie again. And then we continually follow our main character through different parts of his life. Um, he settles down as a family. Is now uh, he's always been stricken with asthma, but it's got worse the older he, he is. And then at the end of the movie, and we're going to touch on a couple of touch points in the movie, which give a little bit of context to what I've already said. But at the end of the movie, he's working in like a like a fun entertainment place for kids that have parties like uh, soft play areas and uh, like arcade machines and whatnot and during uh the singing of happy birthday to to kids he has ostensibly a panic attack um and screams which appears to stop everyone from moving um or maybe a split in reality and he goes to the bathroom and uses a box cutter to open his chest and open it up like um being uncomfortable in his own skin messaging's right on the nose it uh, opens up and there is a glow um a tv glow inside his inside him which is maybe the the real him so to speak uh and then he leaves the movie apologizing to everyone at the end and that's the end of it uh which might seem <laughs> like well duncan you just said a lot of words but not a lot of stuff that goes around that um it's probably worth saying that the movie itself kind of works in juxtaposition with the TV show that's in the background. Also a Twin Peaks technique. So if you ever braved the, the world of Twin Peaks, the TV show that everyone, the sitcom that everyone was obsessed with in Twin Peaks was showing things 
that in a sitcom environment seemed ludicrous, but in Twin Peaks seemed fine. And it was kind of a smart meta approach to storytelling. I saw the TV go kind of does that as well in real life to transcend over. It's revealed that actually the TV show itself a lot cheesier than you see it through a kid's eyes, which makes sense. Things that terrify us as a kid sometimes don't terrify us when we're an adult. Uh, trust me, as someone that grew up watching a ton of 80s horror movies, um, when I go back and watch them now, definitely do not hold up. Not all of them anyway. A lot of them do, but there's a lot of them that I'm like, oh, this was a scary... Critters, when I saw Critters the first time, Critters was one of the scariest things I'd ever seen. And I go back and watch Critters now and I'm just like, this is awful. Uh, fun, but awful. So there's, there's a bit of that. On top of that as well, um, there's a, a kind of revealing of what they actually did as kids when they used to meet up and watch this TV show on Friday nights. And it's actually kind of revealed that there was a, an aspect of our main character where his sexuality came out more um, and he would cross-dress and a lot of these things, which he obviously just purged from his mind. Um, and maybe that in itself those failed remembered memories that he has repressed along with his sexuality which he has repressed over time leads to his illness getting worse and his physical appearance becoming more frail and all the things that surround that. Now, I think there's something in that. I think they, they talk about people that have to hold on to a grave secret and how it, you know, it makes you physically ill. Um... And I think E24 as a film company, I've always said that their horror movies are based on loss. Um, and the evidence is there. If you look at pretty much every single E24 horror movie from like way back, way, way, way back in the day um, through to, I would say, up until recently when they started doing more of the Thai West stuff and um, the thing with the possessed hand, uh, talk to me. If you you look at the older stuff, it's all about loss of something, uh, loss of freedom, loss of innocence, loss of family, loss of self, um, and they're all kind of peppered through. And once you kind of grasp that, I think a lot of the, a lot of the movies and the storytelling make a lot more sense. Uh, what's interesting about Jane Schoenbrunn is I think she does it the other way around. I think they as a director are really interested in doing um, the alternative side of things. So, whereas you could make a movie about the loss of connection, what I think they do really well in their storytelling is that they do it more about the need for connection. Um just kind of almost inverting that message a little bit. And I think on that level, the movie works really, 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 really well. It's where it kind of grabbed me, um, was I found that, I found a lot of the, the storytelling around how difficult it is when you are on the fringe, when you are alternative, to make friends. Um, which seems like such a kind of twee thing to say, but even now, I work in a job where... I can talk about my job, um, not on a podcast because we'll never bore you, but I can talk about my job and I can talk about things around that. And I talk about stuff that I do with my family at the weekend on awkward Teams calls. But if someone asks me what my interests are, I mean, you might as well clear out the room. Like, uh, you know what I mean? No one wants to hear about the 10 years I played in a death metal band. You know what I mean? Like, no one wants to hear that because they don't have those interests in maybe a little bit more straight-laced and a little bit normal, quote-unquote, as perception of society is than I am. So I find, like, even as an adult, I still am very, very good at joining conversations and I was going to say feigning interest, that's a lie. Very good at making interest or capturing interest. But I'm still fully aware that a lot of what I do and a lot of what I like couldn't be any more fringe if it tried. And... I think the movie captures that sentiment in a really good way that even if you don't connect with the the comment about or the subtext about gender and sexuality, which is definitely there and it's, it's hugely prominent and pertinent in the movie, if even if you can't connect to that, I think as a filmmaker, 
Jane Sean Brown has been very smart about adding other details in there which are not of the same weight but at the time feel the same weight to that age group. I think that is a very difficult tightrope to, to balance and I think as a filmmaker they are kind of charting a very interesting voice that we should be all fully aware of. I feel like I've rambled a lot and I feel like I've still not given much away even through spoilers. Um, I would say check the movie out, it might not be for you, it might be for you and the only way to find that out is by you physically checking it out yourself. Uh, like I say, I gave it a 5 out of 5, one of my favourite things I've seen this year. Very much looking forward to seeing where Jane goes next and I hopeful, well, hopefully it continues to be with a budget and I would say hopefully it continues to be with A24. That feels like a good fit. The same way when Ari Aster's making a movie, I kind of want it to be through A24. That feels to me like a good fit. Fit and we'll see where time takes us moving forward. So thank you very much for checking out this review. Now, if you're checking it out on YouTube, then it has a like, a subscribe and ding the bell. That way you get notifications every time I release a new video. And uh, leave comments below. Did you go and check out the movie? Did you like it? Did you not like it? And trust me, I think there's going to be more of the I did not like it. And that's fine. Let's have a dialogue on it though. Did you get something else from this movie? I obviously highlighted three things that I felt were kind of entry points did it connect to you in a way that i didn't mention and if so please let me know if you're checking us out on the spotify or anchor apps where you can get the video and podcast uh, podcast content then make sure you're subscribed there i think there's usually a question that pops up at the end always grateful if you do that but make sure you're subscribed more importantly and then last but not least if you're checking out the audio version of this on any of the podcatchers out there then make sure you're subscribed i have over 1300 episodes of this show on that RSS feed so you can go back and peruse at your leisure and then you will also get every single one coming down the pipe as and when I release them. So yeah, it's a great way to support what I do. Last but not least, thank you again for checking out this episode of the podcast under the stairs another one coming in a couple of days time we're looking at that new exorcist russell crowe movie i'm not going to be speaking about it nearly as high as i'm speaking about i saw the tv glow but to get more detail you gotta check it out so until then wherever you are whatever the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours please take care of yourselves out there this is duncan mcleish broadcasting live from under the stairs and i am signing off